But let's let's go to God in prayer and we'll get started on this lesson. It's a little different than what we've been doing, but I hope it's going to be helpful. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for the beautiful change of the season and the warmer weather. What a blessing. Um, thank you that we're here together as sisters in Christ um, coming to learn more so that we can be stronger and so that we can um, grow in our faith and be able to be more prepared um, to share the good news, the good news that we have in our own life. Um, please be with those who are in need. It just seems there are so many sick and in the hospital and um, a couple of new deaths have taken place um, for people that um, are associated with us in our congregation. We pray for those who are grieving. Um, we also want to pray for Glenda that she will recover and um, come back to us soon. And for Dave who is going to have that neck surgery. Uh, Father, be with the, every single person who works with him and we pray, Father, that you yourself will be the surgeon. We ask your hand and your hands to be in this. Please bless us, Father, individually, each according to our special needs, whether there be joys or sorrows or just worries. Um, help us as, as Brother DeBenin said, to come to you for every care and every decision. Um, strengthen our hearts, increase our faith, um, help our hands be busy doing your work. Bless us, Father, forgive us, and we give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, tonight we're going to be doing the feast. There's six feasts and one fast, so I would say that's a pretty good ratio, wouldn't you? Six feasts and one fast. In fact, uh, I don't want to get into it yet, but there's really in the in the Jewish calendar, there's only one somber, one sad day, one serious day, and that's the Day of Atonement. So if you want to look at it that way, it's, um, well, their calendar was not exactly the same, so I shouldn't say three, 365. It's more like, um, 350 or something to one. So that, again, I think that those are pretty good ratios right there. Um, anyway, let's get going. Now the feasts were all um, given to the children of Israel as commemorative days. They were holy days. You know, holiday means holy day, that's where the words come from, um, and that is, is true of some of ours as well, um, but they were given as remembrances and memorials for specific important events in the history of Israel, and I'm really thankful to God that he did that because otherwise they might forget and we might forget. And as the author pointed out, which I thought was wonderful, that these events are dear to us too, aren't they? And most of these uh, holidays that we're gonna, festivals and feasts that we're gonna talk about tonight have, um, meaning in the New Testament era, in the New Covenant. Uh, God, God does that all the time. We're, we're getting close, we're just a couple weeks away from our lesson on prophecy, Christ and prophecy. And what I have seen as I've studied um, and just learned something about the prophecies is that many, many times God has a dual purpose for the prophecy. Likewise, with these feasts, God has a dual purpose um, for the feast. 
one in the Old Testament and another greater and more complete fulfillment in the New. He's just amazing. He's just marvelous. He's just such a genius in doing these things for us to really give um, the, the full and true meaning of all of this. All right. Um, so the feasts were to commemorate events in old, the Old Testament life. And we're going to be doing kind of a mosaic here because um, we're going to be covering the questions, I hope, as we go through the answers to your questions for the lesson. But tell me, what are the three great feasts? Pentecost and Tabernacles. Right, and they all were to be celebrated in Jerusalem at the temple only, only. And we'll hopefully, if there's time, I'm going to show you something on that. And then what were the three lesser feasts? Trumpets, dedication, and Purim. And they were celebrated anywhere. And they are still celebrated by Jews today. All right, so the author begins by explaining to us that there's a patriarchal calendar versus a mosaic or Jewish calendar. Now, the patriarchal calendar, the new year began in the fall. Once all of the harvests were completed and it was time to plant again, that was the new year, new planting, new year. And a lot of these feasts, besides the fact they commemorate special events in the history of, of Israel, they also have a physical aspect to them as far as the time of year. And even that is spiritual. So hopefully I'll remember to say these things as we go along. But um, the, the, the patriarchal calendar began, um, it was either late September or early to, uh, October, because the Jewish calendar, even today, the Jew Jewish religious calendar is different from ours. And I have this whole thing on the calendars and the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar and all that. I'm actually just not going to do it because we don't have time, but the calendars have changed <coughs> over the years. Um, so uh, that, that today, even today, um, the blowing of the trumpets, which is generally speaking in the September, beginning of October, is Jewish New Year. And that corresponds to Rosh Hashanah if you know anything about the Jewish calendar. So they blow the trumpets because it's a new year and it's a new beginning. Um, but God changed the calendar. So while I'm saying that, I'll just say there's your civil calendar and that still begins in the fall at Rosh Hashanah and the blowing of the trumpets. And then there's your sacred or spiritual calendar, which um, is different. And we'll, we'll, we'll read a couple verses to help us get that in our head. So if you'd like to turn to um, Exodus 12, and we're going to see the first feast here, uh, which is... Passover. Okay, could I get somebody to uh, read verses 2 and verses 6? Well, in fact, Jana, um, verses 1 and 2 and then skip on down. To six. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, 
This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. You're killing a lamb, the Passover lamb. That's what it's referring to in verse 6. So God changed the calendar and he said, this is the, the new year, this is the first day of your month, and this from now on, this is going to be considered the first month of the year. And that corresponds usually to the end of March, the beginning or middle of April. I looked it up, this year Passover is April 15th. And you know, it moves around, and this is the reason, it's because um, our calendar does not coincide exactly with the Jewish sacred calendar. So this year, Passover is on April 15th, and that's their first month, right? The 14th day of the first month. So April this year is their first month. Usually it is March, end of March, beginning of April. And then our um, uh, Easter falls this year on the 17th. Makes sense, right? Passover um, on the 15th and then uh, Easter on the 17th. So you have death, burial, resurrection right there. Okay, um, so God changed that and he made the, the Passover mark the beginning of their new year. Um, so I want to read just a little bit. In fact, let's turn to Exodus, yeah. And I'll just mention this right now. If you want to learn all about the feast, because each one of these passages gives you additional information, um, you can read uh, Leviticus, Leviticus 23, which we're going to be reading a lot of Leviticus 23 tonight, because it has to do with the time. It has to do with the calendar, and that's what this lesson is emphasizing. Um, um, we're also going to read the one in Exodus 23 because it's brief and it introduces the major feasts. Then Numbers 28 and 29 emphasizes the sacrifices themselves. It gives the most detail about how they celebrate it in the temple and, or in the tabernacle with the sacrifices. But I also added Deuteronomy 16 because that, I love Deuteronomy because it always gives you the why. You know, it's the new generation about, about to enter the land and God gives the law a second time through Moses, and there's a lot of why you're going to be doing this. And so I really love that. And it also emphasizes who. So Deuteronomy 16 is a very enriching passage for those reasons. But first, let's go to Exodus 23, and let's get introduced to these uh, the three major feasts. And I'm going to point out just a couple things that I think are really important here. Um, so we're in Exodus 23, 14 uh, through 19. Three times a year you shall celebrate a feast to me. Okay, I'm going to stop already. God wanted them to celebrate. He wanted them to feast. And he wanted them to commemorate and remember these great deliverances and great miraculous milestones in their history. What, what God did, how he loved them, how he saved them, and uh, what a great work of God it was in their life. So he wanted them to celebrate. 
All right, um, verse 15. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the appointed time in the month of Abib, which is for in it you came out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty handed. Now, there's several verses in the Bible in these passages that reiterate that. Don't come before me empty handed. These are celebrations, but they are also times of worship and times of sacrifices. And um, I think that's, that's something that always kind of like, do scriptures ever poke you in the stomach? There's some scriptures that like really poke me in the stomach. And this is one of them. I do not want to appear before God in the day I meet him face to face empty-handed and he he wants us to be involved in his kingdom and in the work he has to do on earth and so he's saying here that at Passover do not appear to me empty-handed all right let's go on verse 16 also you should observe so that was the first one that's just the introduction like i said these other chapters are going to shed more light and give more full descriptions and explanations but these are just this is way back in exodus this is right after the ten commandments ten commandments are in chapter 20 this is verse 23 god is simply introducing the three major feasts here all right verse 16 also you shall observe the feast of the harvest of the first fruits of your labors from what you sow in the field. Uh, so that's the second one. Okay? That one is Pentecost. But it's also called the feast of first fruits. Um, and let's see. And I should say this. The Passover is also called the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And we remember that. They left Egypt in haste. God did not want them to celebrate this with leaven. Um, I can give you the whole history on that. Um, the Egyptians were one of the first people on earth to develop yeast. And the yeast at that time was fermented. It was dirty. It was it was dirty. Our yeast is, you know, don't worry about buying yeast. You can buy yeast today. But their yeast was not clean. And it does still have a fermented quality. That's what causes the rising of the dough. But, um, again, this is God. He didn't want them to take anything from Egypt with them in their thinking or otherwise. And when they celebrated to him this Passover um, deliverance, he didn't want any traces of Egypt in, in the celebration, in the Passover. Um, so then the next one is Pentecost, and that's um, the, the harvest of the first fruits. So it's the very first grain, the very first barley um, for the Jews. And then also here in verse 16, also the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in the fruit of your labors from the field. So Pentecost is the first of the harvests. It's the barley. And um, tabernacles, which we'll see that later, is also called the feast of the ingathering. And it's done when all of the harvest is done, all of the, the figs, the perm, uh, pomegranates, the dates, all of that late summer fruit is all harvested. So it's the end of that cycle. It's the end of the agricultural cycle. So right now we're getting the skinny on it. We're getting the time of year and we're getting how it corresponds to their year, to their agricultural year. We're going to get more. Okay, um, verse 18. 
You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifices of leavened bread. See, there it is. Nor is the fat of the feast to remain overnight until the morning. You shall bring the choice first fruits. So that one, verse 18, has to do with Passover specifically, with the leaven. Um, but the bread of the presence, I'll go ahead and say this, the bread of the presence that was daily, morning and evening, fresh bread, that was also unleavened as well. Okay, verse 19. You shall bring the choice first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. You are not to boil a kid in the milk of its mother because that was pagan. The, they sacrificed weird, of course. Um, uh, that I won't go into that. I can go into that. Let's not. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So uh, the Passover corresponds of course to what help me ladies you know this stuff their deliverance from egypt right god passing over their houses when he saw the blood of that lamb painted on the lintel and the do doorpost and how does that correspond to us now today in the christian age well, yeah, when was Jesus when was Jesus crucified? Passover. Remember John the Baptist, behold the lamb, right? Passover lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. How would these Corinthians know this? Paul is talking to the Corinthian church as if they know this stuff. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. He says, Clean out the old leaven, that you may be a, a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has also been sacrificed. Do you know what that tells me? They, they had teaching on this, haven't they? They understand what the leaven or the unleavened bread means. And they understand that Jesus Christ is that lamb that was foreordained before the foundation of the world, right? To come and give his body as a sacrifice, as the lamb of God, the pure unblemished lamb of God, to use his blood to pay for our sins. So, Passover has its greater fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Um, okay, so let's uh, read Leviticus. You're going to want to be in Leviticus, uh, those of you who are following along in your Bibles. You're going to want to be in Leviticus 23 because we're going to return to it a couple more times. And I really like this chapter, even though it doesn't have some of the same uh, features that uh, Numbers 28 and 29 and um, Deuteronomy uh, 16 has. But I like this because it's concise and it brings all of their um, religious festivals, laws together, including the Sabbath, which is, you know, their weekly um, worship to God, their weekly convocation. Convocation means to call together, to call together God's people. So whenever you see that, if, if you've got, um, I don't know if the NFV, I don't have my NFV with me tonight, but most of the other um, translations will call it that. All right, so let's look at Leviticus uh, 23, verses 6 through 8. Um, in fact, I'm going to start with five. Um, I'm going to start with four. Okay. 
Um, these are the appoint, appointed times of the Lord, holy convocations. This is apart from the Sabbath. The Sabbath is dealt in 1 through 3, and it is also a holy convocation. All right. Um, these are the appointed times of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. Verse 5. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there is the feast of the unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. But for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. So there, there's a Passover described for us in, in its basics. Okay, so each family had a, a lamb um, that they also slaughtered and um, two families or even three families could come together if that was too much food. Um, that they would celebrate it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs um, to commemorate their suffering and the bitterness of their lives while they were slaves for 400 years in Egypt and then to remember how God delivered them from that slavery with great miracles and powers and with the parting in the Red Sea, etc. All right, let's go on to Pentecost. And again, uh, Pentecost is also called First Fruits because it's when the barley harvest begins, followed closely by the wheat harvest. A very fun and interesting thing to do is to read Ruth because Ruth begins to take place at the barley harvest and it ends at the end of the wheat harvest when Boaz um, goes to say to the elders of the town that he wants to marry her. So you kind of have the time frame there. It's ne really neat. So all of this takes place at, at those times between um, between those harvests, at the end of those harvests. Okay, so Pentecost, um, Pente means 50. And so Pentecost always takes place exactly 50 days after Passover. It's seven weeks plus one day. And so it always falls on Sunday which just let that settle in, okay? Jesus died on Friday. He arose from the grave early, just about dawn, on Sunday, right? And when did the church get established? First day? Pentecost, right? So, the gospel came, the new law came, the new covenant came on the day of Pentecost. All those years later, Jesus rose on a Sunday. Pentecost came, right? He arose, he was with his disciples, he was with them 40 days. Then he said, I'm going to ascend now, stay in Jerusalem, how come? The Holy Spirit's going to come. All right. Ten days later, well, actually it was, it was only seven days later because you can't count, you have to count those other three days. So he left them technically 43 days after his death. Okay, three days plus 40. And then seven days later, you have the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, the first proclamation of 
the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the beginning of the church, 3,000 saved. See how God is using all this? And what's it called? It's called first fruits. So what do we have here, ladies? We have the beginning of the kingdom of God, the church, the first fruits of God's kingdom. Does that give you chills? That gives me chills. Okay, so that's the first fruit of God's new kingdom. Now, Pentecost also commemorated what important historical um, event in the life of the Jews? Giving the law. So what do we have on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes? The giving of a new covenant. The giving of a new law. Why? Because Jesus has risen from the dead and his law is now in effect. The words of Jesus Christ and his apostles are now the new law. And that began the word. You can read Micah 5. You can read... Um, Isaiah 2 and some other passage that talk about on that day the law will go forth from Zion, etc. That's what we have, we're talking about here. Is God not amazing? Okay. Alright, so let's, let's read that if we're still in Leviticus 23. Um, let's look at uh, verses 6 through 8. Then on the 15th day of the same month, oh no, not that one. I mixed up here. Let me get the right one. Verse 15. Okay, let's skip on down to verse 15. So all of that is about Passover and the grain offering and all of those things. Um, look at verse 15. You shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath. So you're starting to count you're starting to count from Passover, correct? Right? That's how you count to get to Pentecost. It's going to be 49 days plus 1. Or, yeah, 49 days plus 1. You shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought in the sheave offering, and there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. 7 times 7, 49. You shall count off 50 days to the day from the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring in from your dwelling places two loaves of bread for a wave offering made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. So this one is okay with leaven. And it's two loaves, and they were barley loaves because that was the harvest that was starting at that time of year. And those are giving God the first and the best of the new harvest coming in because that's what he requires. You, you get to eat all year long. <laughs> you get all the harvest you want. You know, celebrate all you want. But just remember me, because I gave it to you, and bring me the first of your harvest. Okay. Um, there's a couple other things I want to say, and um, I don't know if I should do it right now. But I already said that God wants us to celebrate, um, and and He wants these to be joyous times. So if you would just keep your hand here, because I'm afraid I'm going to forget to say this at all. Let's go to Deuteronomy um, chapter 12. And again, like like I mentioned, one of the reasons I love Deuteronomy so much is because it explains why on so many of these laws and gives them great sense and fuller meaning. But let's look at Deuteronomy um, chapter 12 and um, I want to look at verse 
4. Uh, start in verse 4. Um, he's comparing the pagans and, and the peoples of the other nations and their sacrifices and their worship to the worship he desires. It says, um, You shall not act like this toward the Lord your God, but you shall seek the Lord at the place which the Lord your God shall choose from all your tribes to establish his name there for his dwelling, and there you shall come. So uh, just a little aside on that. God, while they were in the desert, the tabernacle moved from place to place. But once they came into the land, it, it took time. You know, you know, it did take time. It took 487 years from the time they left Egypt till the time the temple was built. But God had in mind to choose a place. And I have verses on it where I don't have time to read them where it explains that God chose Jerusalem. He chose it. From all the tribes, etc. He chose Jerusalem for his name to dwell and for a house to be built for him. And we read last week, if you remember, why the exact site, the exact location of the temple was on Mount Moriah. We read all that. Remember that from last week? Okay. All right, um, verse 6. And there, meaning that place, you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your contributions from your hand, your votive offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. Now, uh, this is the part. There also you and your household shall eat before the Lord your God and rejoice in all of your undertakings with which the Lord has blessed you. He wants us to eat with him. Did you catch that? And we talked a little bit before about the fellowship offerings, which were also meals with God. Okay, skip on down to verse 12. And there you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levites who are within your gates, since he has no portion or inheritance with you. Now, go to verse uh, chapter 16, rather. For a little more rejoicing. We may have a little more rejoicing here. Chapter 16, verse 11. Um, the, again, these these are about the, the festivals, the, the three main festivals. And you shall rejoice, for 1611, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. You and your sons and your daughters and your male and female servants and the Levi who is in your town and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are in your midst in the place for the Lord your God chooses to establish his name. Verse 14, and ye shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your male and female servants and the Levite and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are in your town. Rejoicing, rejoicing. Like I said, six feasts, one day of atonement one day of being solemn. Okay, I can see we're good. We're now the time here. Okay, trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and tabernacles all fall in the same month. Trumpets is the first day of the seventh month, and that hails or announces the, the new year. And that is the feast we are waiting for. That is the one we're waiting for. Tabernacles is the end gathering. It's at the end. It's when all the harvest is completed. How many times, think about this, did Jesus talk about the end of the world as the harvest? Right? He's going to send out his angels. They're going to reap the earth. 
and they are going to gather God's people into the barn like a harvest. That is the one that hasn't happened yet. Passover is Jesus' death, right? Pentecost is the beginning of the church. Tabernacles and the ingathering is at the end of the year. It's the final feast of the cycle of the great feast, okay? And it is the ingathering. It's when all of the fruit is harvested and brought into the barn. That is the one that has not happened yet. That is the one we are waiting for. Um, so let me see what else in the just a little. The three lesser feasts, well, I've covered some of this. Trumpets is also associated with the seventh month. The Feast of De Dedication commemorates when the Maccabees, and we just studied that a few weeks ago, right? When they um, expelled the, the Syrians, Antiochus Epiphanes, and he was so horrible, I could review that, but I'm not going to. And they got uh, possession of the temple back, and they cleansed it, and the, the priests uh, consecrated themselves again, and they were, re uh, um, they were allowed to relight the lamps. So it's also called um, the Feast of Lights for that reason, because the temple was um, consecrated, the priests were consecrated, and the worship was set up again after um, being forbidden under Antiochus uh, number three and Antiochus number four, especially. Okay, um, and then Purim has to do with Esther, if you know that, right? Um, Haman, if you want to read back chapter 3 of Esther, Haman threw lots, and the lot fell to the 12th month, and they designated the 13th day. But because of Esther's fasting and praying and so forth, and, and begging, basically, her husband, Xerxes, the Jews were allowed to defend themselves and not face annihilation because the decree was for total annihilation of the Jewish people. Um, so on the 14th and 15th, and this falls in March, 14th and 15th of that month, they have a celebration which is also joyful and they send presents to each other besides just feasting to celebrate that God saved them. Oh, and I want to tell you this, and this is not me, I, I read this various places, that in the Jewish calendar, the tabernacles, which, you know, it commemorates the wilderness wanderings when they lived in tents and they get those beautiful boughs of the leafy trees and they make themselves temporary shelters. They, they go camping for seven days basically to remember, to remember what God, how he provided for them in the wilderness 40 years. All that manna, I wonder how much manna that was. I wonder how much quail that was. I wonder how much water that was. But to rejoice in his provision. But um, so that again, that coincides um, with tabernacles and the ingathering. Um, and I was going to say something else, but who knows what, what that was. All right, um, so you can read about the institution of Purim in Esther chapter 9, verse 27 and following. Okay, we're a little over, but I just want to end with the Day of Atonement. Um, if you would like to uh, turn with me to Leviticus um, chapter 23 again, and I'm going to read 26 um, through, through 
32. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On exactly the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. And I we talked about that before. Atonement means to hide or cover over. It actually means to cover over. So whenever we read atonement, for us it means that God is hiding or covering over our sins so he no longer sees them anymore. Okay. Um, on exactly the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation to you, and you shall humble your souls. So after all of this feasting and rejoicing and festivals and gifts and eating and celebrating with God, there's one day he wants to re us to remember that we need him. He wants us to, or them, because I'm not a Jew and probably you are not, and these feasts are Old Testament, they're not New Covenant, but we're just trying to understand them a little better. Um, we do sin, and there is a time when we should realize that we sin and that we need God's grace and his, the blood of Jesus Christ to cover, to cover over those sins. And that's what this is about. You shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire to the Lord. Neither shall you do any work on the same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement on your behalf before the Lord your God. So it was personal atonement and it was national atonement. It was for the people of Israel as well. But guess what? He asked them to fast, wants them to humble themselves, but he says, but I don't want you to work. Now, how kind and benevolent. He doesn't want them to work because he knows they're fasting, right? Let's just worship today. No work, okay? He is a good, benevolent, and generous, and loving, and kind God. Okay? All right. Uh, verse 28. Neither shall you do any work on this same day, for it's the day of atonement, to make atonement on your behalf before the Lord your God. If there is any person who will not humble himself on this same day, he shall be cut off from his people. So this is required. As for the person who does any work on the same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. So you will fast and you will not work. He emphasizes both parts of that. You shall do, do no work at all. It is to be a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It is to be a Sabbath of complete rest to you. And you shall humble yourselves um, on the ninth of the month at evening until from evening to evening you shall keep your Sabbath. So as we know, and this goes back to Genesis 1, Jewish days start in the evening. They're always from evening to evening, Passover is evening to evening, Day of Atonement, evening to evening. Why? In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, what does it say? Chapter 1, verse 5, verse 8, I think it's a couple other places, it says, and so there was evening and morning, the first day, the fifth day, whatever. So that's how it's all calculated. All right, we're quitting right now. I hope that brings more understanding to us of these feasts and all they mean to us. And my last word on this is going to be, we need these things because we're forgetful. And these are important events that God did in the life of Israel in the Old Testament that have correlation to us in, in the, as New Covenant Christians. But don't forget what I think is the most important one of all. And that is the Lord's Supper. It is also an observance. It is both happy and sad, is it not? And we need that more than the Jews needed those feasts in the Old Testament. 
because we don't want to ever, ever, ever forget what Jesus did for us. And when we celebrate and when we commemorate on the first day of the week, the Lord's Supper, we can cherish and remember, we can do what it, they did on the Day of Atonement and examine our lives and ask for forgiveness. And then we can joyfully partake in the body and the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who offers us heaven. So I, and what did Jesus say? Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. All right, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, oh, thank you, dear Lord, for all of this. Uh, we only touch the hem of the garment here, and there's so much more to um, really um, delve into and to cherish and to relish about uh, what you've done for your people Israel in the past and how it uh, precisely relates to us through Jesus Christ in the New Covenant. Thank you for giving us all of this and thank you for foreseeing it and planning it for us. Most of all, Father, we do thank you for Jesus, um, our hope, our love, our faith, our future, our present is all in his hands and we thank you for him. In his name we pray.